But at no point can I really find who it is who's made this decision or how it is I can stop this money. But, you know, in your, your book, I have to say, you know, I did enjoy the book, but it, it, it's a pretty dismal picture of the British state. And not just the political class, but, but the civil service, the, you know, every administrative function of the British state, with some exceptions, with individuals or, or, or prison officers trying to do their best in a, in a, a collapsing system. Um, it, it's, it doesn't look like a, a, a system that's capable of reform from your perspective. No, no. I mean, I think it is very, very, very bad. I mean, part of the point of the book is to try to describe as carefully and in as much detail as I can just how bad the situation is. To really make people smell and feel how rotten it is, how little policy is discussed, how utterly lacking in seriousness so many of these ministerial conversations are. How unbelievably short term, to try to bring to life. I mean, we, 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 we can pick up um, statistics by listening to the Today program. So we're aware that Grant Shapps has had five jobs in just over a year, five cabinet positions in just over a year. But the book is about trying to make you understand what that really means. What does it mean to have a cabinet minister come in and barely do the job for two or three months before they... And what does that imply about the prime minister? that the Prime Minister can think it's sensible for someone only to be in a job for two or three months. What does that imply for the way the civil service responds to that minister? I mean, is it surprising that the civil service digs its heels in, often doesn't do what the minister wants if they think they're only going to be there for two or three months? You, and someone you, else describe, turn up? you describe that very effectively in your encounters with DFID, where you have conscientious and presumably experienced and intelligent people who don't want to do what you want because they think, well, you're going to be gone in 10 minutes and yeah. the next guy is yeah. going to want the opposite. Yeah. They, they, exactly. So I frequently found this. Now, this isn't um, a criticism of individuals. It's a criticism, I think, of the system, of the structure. Quite understandably, a lot of the different civil servants felt this person is coming in. This is a very difficult moment where we feel we can sense that Boris Johnson is coming and this guy is threatening to abolish our department and get rid of the 0.7% on international aid. So the whole department is in a defensive crouch. A minister arrives and wants to reform things and they feel, how long is this minister going to be there? What does this minister know anyway? Does the minister really have the support of the prime minister? Will anything that they do actually be continued by his successor? And if their answers to those things is we're not sure about that at all, they will simply block almost anything that you want to do, right? Without quite admitting it to themselves, because of course they're good conscientious civil servants who want to do their best, who've been trained to feel, you know, civil servants advise, ministers decide. But at some deep intuitive level, everything gets delayed and blocked. And that then creates a very vicious cycle between the minister and the different civil servant. Let, let me give you one example that's not in the book uh, to give you a, a bonus director's cut. So, it's, it's, so there's some point in you coming to this uh, rather than reading the book. Um, I uh, had been in my new office in Diffid for about three weeks, and I discovered that we were spending £150 million a year in Yemen. Nobody in the system had bothered to explain to me that we had nobody on the ground in Yemen. This was not mentioned. In fact, in Parliament, opposition MPs were paying tribute to the brave British diplomats and aid workers in Yemen <laughs> when we had had nobody on the ground in Yemen for at least two and a half years. Nobody. Right? Now, I knew that because actually my friend had been in the embassy in Yemen and had been one of the last people to be evacuated two and a half years earlier. And I just, I'd been at Yemen then at the moment just before that evacuation. So I said to my team, listen, how many of you have been to Yemen? None of them have been to Yemen, okay? How do we know when we're spending 150 million pounds a year in Yemen that this money is being spent responsibly? And the answer was, well, minister, we can conduct Skype conversations with the Yemenis we're giving the money to. So I said, can I see an example of one of these Skype conversations? 
sort of silence around the room, and I sense there's something a little bit awkward. But I say, look, please don't worry, you know, take three weeks, take four weeks. They're still looking at me a bit sort of freaked out. I say, take six weeks, <laughs> just, just come back and show me a two minute Skype conversation with a Yemeni so I can see what's happening here. Six weeks to the day later, a much more senior people, deputy directors, directors from DFID, come in and say, Minister, can you please explain to us why you're so keen to see this Skype conversation with the Yemeni? And I say, listen, you know, I can produce seven pompous reasons why I think it's quite a good idea if you're giving 150 million pounds to a country a year, you have some idea who you're giving it to. But there's a more basic thing. I asked you to do it. Right, just do it, I don't care. Fake it, just give me something. Um, and of course it never came. I mean, uh, I, and I would get, I got more and more frustrated. It's only leaving, it's only leaving now that I realized what happened, and this was frequently the case. I actually thought this whole thing is mad. Why are they refusing to show this to me? It, it's only now I realize there was never any Skype conversation with the Yemeni. This, a junior civil servant had obviously been panicked in this conversation with me and hadn't felt confident enough at the end of the meeting to say, I'm sorry, Minister, I said we have Skype conversations with the Yemenis. A a actually, we don't. I can see that's a problem. We'll go and sort it out. But at no point did anyone feel confident enough, to be honest, creating this sense of sort of paranoid dysfunction. So did you ever find out what was happening to the, what was it, 350 million? 150 million 150. a year, yeah. Um, well, two years later, having been assured that the money was properly accounted for and nothing was going wrong, David Beasley, who was the head of the World Food Program, to whom we were giving a lot of the money, came to see me to say we have a very big problem. We think between a third and a half of our food aid is being stolen by the Houthis and Sana'a. And I was then with the same different civil servants, so I'm like, Right. You also describe an absolutely Kafkaesque chase um, it, when you're trying to stop money going to local councils in Syria, which you argue are <coughs> jihadi. So we're actually directly funding jihadi groups. And this chase leads you through not only the byways and, and, and blind alleys of the British system, but also the American system, the security services, and you never find out, as far as I recall, who is in authorizing and insisting on this to the point that it's impossible to cancel. How do you explain that? I mean, is this the hidden hand of the intelligence services? Is it massive dysfunctional bureaucracy in which nobody wants to take responsibility for anything? I, 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 how do you, having had well, that direct experience? Yeah, so foreign policy is very, very uh, weird. So, uh, so in this particular case that Isabel's raising, uh, the British government had decided that they wanted to provide funding to the opposition groups in northwest Syria. And the reasons for this uh, go back, of course, to opposition to Bashar al-Assad and his murderous regime in Damascus. So these were groups on the Turkish border that were holding out against the Assad regime. Over the course of uh, six, seven years, these areas were increasingly dominated by Al-Qaeda affiliates, and some of them ISIS affiliates. And of course, it was much too dangerous in these areas for any British staff to get anywhere nearby. And I had seen in Iraq what happened when we started providing funding to these types of areas and how quickly they got uh, distorted. So when you challenge something like this, you, you realize that a decision has been made five or six years earlier, which is that we're going to back these groups in northwest Syria. Things have changed over time, and it then becomes almost impossible to identify who made that decision or how we're getting out of it. And as Isabel said, I chased. You know, I ended up, they would say, oh, it's not our decision, it's the Americans' decision, so I'd go and find out what American... Special Operations Command was thinking, what the Trump administration was thinking, what the Secret Service was thinking, what our ambassador in exile was thinking. Finally, I get all the way to the Prime Minister's advisor. But at no point can I really find who it is who's made this decision or how it is I can stop this money uh, from flowing through. It eventually only stops because somebody catches on video 
one of the people we're funding appears on a video at a big Al-Qaeda conference with a huge Al-Qaeda flag <laughs> behind. Um, uh, and this was one of the kind of diffid funded characters. And it was at that moment eventually the civil servants come in and say, Minister, we're stopping this program. But it, it's, um, it is very interesting. And I think one of the other lessons I took is that I thought that because I had served in Iraq and Afghanistan and I knew Syria reasonably well and I'd been to Yemen and I'd spent 10, 15 years of my life working on the Middle East and Asia and spoke three Asian languages that that would give me some sort of authority in the department. It gave me none at all. As a minister, you are nobody. Right? As a minister, fundamentally, you have the authority of your office, but you have nothing else. Right? Your only authority is your ability to appeal to a manifesto or say, this is what we were voted in to deliver. What you cannot do is say to a civil servant, actually, I've spent longer in Afghanistan than you have. I don't think this program makes sense. You, you, you're not treated like a normal human being in that way. Um, on, on that question of power and frustration, you know, it, reading your book, it, it's clear that you have a lot of very well-grounded policy ideas. Uh, you know a lot. <coughs> You've been to lots of places. So you're, you're quite strong, if, if you like, on policy. But, but if politics is the art of enacting policy, I have to say, Rory, you're, as a politician, it's maybe not your major talent. <laughs> um, I, I think that is unfair, actually. I'm, I'm um, shocked. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's unfair. Um, I, I spend a lot of time in the book beating myself up and criticizing myself you do for, what, for what I failed to do. Um, but I think I'm trying to do so to illustrate a much bigger problem. I'm not trying to say I'm an unusually inept implementer <laughs> of policy. I'm trying to explain why in the system politicians in general do not implement much policy. Um, what I learned is that to implement policy, you need to make much bolder gestures. So if I look at the things that were successful, so I brought together the first proper effective UK Africa strategy. How did I do that? I did that not by arguing uh, the toss in seminar rooms. I did it by spending seven months with a group of civil servants writing a national security strategy. Or if I look at what it took to reduce violence in prisons after five years of rising violence, that took me going out to the media and saying, I will resign in 12 months unless violence reduces. Suddenly, things change. Suddenly, weirdly, that slogan, that appeal to the media, gave me power I didn't have before. Then an operations room set up. Then we can focus on the 10 prisons. Then I have the legitimacy to get in on the landings. And then, after five years of violence tripling, we're able to start bringing violence down. Again, in DFID, I was able to double our spend on climate and the environment. Very big increase, you know, billions of pounds of increase of spending. But again, only by going straight to the media, not by trying to have the argument inside the department, by literally saying to Peston on ITV, I am doubling the spending on climate and the environment. So I did achieve changes, but they were not achieved by trying to argue the toss around a conference table. They're done by making these very binary, almost slogan-like gestures. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.